the light leaders and I get together and we um, do a masterclass. And what that is, is where the light leader gets to share their expertise, their experience, their amazingness. And um, today, Jackie, uh, because it is heart month, February, you know, you know it. Um, she is sharing with us what um, happy heart choices are for you. Um, she has quite the story with her own experience with heart disease. And um, she's going to be sharing with us tips and things we could be doing to keep our heart healthy. So thanks so much for joining us. And Jackie, take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adara, for that lovely introduction. And Thank you, Beth and Laura, for joining us here today. Hopefully we can get a few more because I do have prizes to give away tonight. So you want to be on for some prizes. So people, if you are watching, make sure you get in the Zoom room. Get those prizes. You want those prizes. They're good prizes. <laughs> so come on in. <laughs> Alrighty. So my name is Jackie and I am Healthy Heart Coach Jackie and I am an integrative heart health coach. And I help those with heart disease and risk factors who are looking for something different and a little bit of magic, be empowered with choice and knowledge so that they can live their best lives. Alrighty, so tonight what I am going to do is I'm gonna be sharing with you a bit of, where's my start thing? I always lose that thing here. Um, <laughs> a little bit about my journey and some tips and tricks for heart disease and you know, there's going to be a couple surprises in there for, for you guys um, about things you didn't know and surprises at the end. So just before we get started, you know, got to cover those disclaimers for myself. So I'm not a medical professional. This is not medical advice. This presentation is just based on my own personal research and experience. Please consult your medical professional before making any changes in your diet or exercise or any other kind of thing in your life program. And if you're having any symptoms, please contact your medical professional for further advice. But all that being said, I am here to help you as a coach and guide you on your health and wellness journey. <laughs> and for those of you on here and watching, I am a very lax presenter. So please feel free at any time um, for those of you on live, if you have a question to interrupt ask a question or type in the chat box a question. Um, it does show on my screen if you type in one. So as I'm showing, um, sharing my things. So yeah, it'll be good. Alrighty, so this is me. So I have been happy and adventurous my whole life. Um, this is actually one of, I love angel wing pictures where you can take them with your angel wing background. I have a collection of photos from around the world with angel wings and I've lived overseas and uh, two years ago um, I became I was in Antarctica <laughs> and I, you probably find me there <laughs> and the orange one and <laughs> I was having a great time I was mountaineering I was hiking Patagonia where it was well, an all-female uh, girl expedition and we did all sorts of fun things and then I came back for New Year's and I became very sick and I put on almost 80 pounds in about two weeks. I was puking pink, pink foam. I couldn't breathe. I was so exhausted. I couldn't go from the bed to the bathroom without having to take a nap on the bathroom floor. I was going from ER to ER and being turned away, being told I was just fat, lose weight and I feel better. And, um, or I was told it was just a virus, just rest and you'll feel better. This went on for months until finally a friend um, from this trip to Antarctica, who's a pulmonologist, a lung doctor in Ireland. Uh, I actually sent her a list of my symptoms and a picture of myself because she'd just seen me a few months before with, you know, just, 
give me something. <laughs> I'm dying here. <laughs> They're turning me away. And she looked, took one look at my picture, one look at my symptoms, and within minutes got back to me and said, go bang on doors to whatever you have to do, get an echocardiogram. So I did, and it turned out I had a 15% functioning heart. And um, from unknown causes was the official was, yeah, is idiopathic was the official cause. And this is even knowing that I have a genetic disorder that has a 50% heart congenital heart defect rate. And which I do have a congenital heart defect with that, but they said still had no cause. So and then I had to start on my journey of healing myself. So before we go any farther, um, I would love to for you guys to just maybe put in the chat box or maybe just chime in, whatever you prefer. Um, what symptoms do you think a female would have who has heart issues? Anybody? Alrighty. <laughs> oh, we got some. Okay, there we go. So fluttering heart and tight arms and tightness in the neck. Yes. Those are some that females have. Anybody else have any ideas? Out of breath, moving around. Yep, absolutely. Out of breath and moving around. Okay. All right, yeah, so those are all really good, um, good kind of general ones. So what I'm going to show you right now is this is a video from the American Heart Association Go Red for Women campaign um, about just to, and this is um, put together. So every year the American Heart Association votes in 25 women to be their spokespeople. So this is a combination of the 25 women who are this year's spokespeople's stories. It started out like a totally normal day. Okay, move objection deadline to the third line after survey. who has a heart attack. Totally fine. Don't forget to wear the high socks with the shin guards. Forget about the shin guards, Mom. Come on, Mrs. Underdog is not going to wait. shortness of breath, muscle pain, achiness, this terrible pressure in my chest. Oh, really? They can be here in how long? <gasps> Two minutes. Can you make it ten? I thought I had gas. 
Turns out, I was having a heart attack. Heart disease is the number one killer of American women. So now I take care of my heart, and I tell the women in my life to do the same. Sounds great, by the way. That's nice, sweetie, but that's not my heart. That is. Make it your mission to save your life and the lives of the women you love. Find out more from the American Heart Association at GoRedForWomen.org. <laughs> yeah, so that's just kind of a combination. So can anybody relate to that situation of being the super powerful mom, you know, in a high-end career <laughs> and just being so busy and so stressed? Has anybody ever felt that in their life where they're just that person? And so, yeah, yes, working hard and then burning out, absolutely. Yeah, and so this is something that we are, that us ladies are trying to promote is that ever since the 1950s, heart disease in women has almost doubled. And it's still constantly missed in the medical system. Okay, we're done with you. Thank you. <laughs> Talking to the video. So there is some differences between male and female heart symptoms, um, which some of them you saw in the video there and you guys already know about because they're pretty well talked about. So for male and female, they both they can both get chest pain excessive sweating, inability to sleep, and shoulder pain, specifically in the left, sometimes in the right, but not very often. But these are the ones that are specifically to females. Now, females can have one or all of these and have heart and have something going on with their heart. So they can have nausea, vomiting, unexplained weight gain. So if you're gaining weight, and there's no reason why you haven't been overeating, you know, your exercise routine stayed the same and stuff. Um, it could be backflow of blood from the heart. So it's fluid buildup, it could be. Um, back pain, it doesn't have to be necessarily chest pains in females, it can also be between the shoulder pain. Swelling of the hands and feet. Now this is something that, most people don't know is your chest actually has a really large cavity so by the time so your chest can hold about 10 pounds of fluid before it'll show up in your hands and feet so that's why you have the unexplained weight gain there dizziness fatigue you can just be tired and shortness of breath and a lot of these get missed um, because they are very subtle. Um, if anybody agrees, Anatomy fan here? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm a big Grey's Anatomy fan. I love Grey's Anatomy. Um, and yeah, Dr. McDreamy, yes. <laughs> love her McDreamy too. <laughs> But, and there's this one episode where Dr. Bailey, who's the head of, um, of surgery, um, has a heart attack and they make her go to psych services, even as the head of surgery at a hospital. And this is um, actually, I mean, that's a little exaggerated, but it is quite common in females and heart disease. So I didn't have any of the male and female symptoms, but I had quite a few of the female symptoms. So then I had to start looking for um, causes of heart disease because one of the things that came up is that I was actually turned out to be allergic to all pharmaceuticals except for blood thinners and a class of drugs called ARBs. So I couldn't handle the drugs. So the first thing I discovered when I started looking far and wide in my international network and, and research and all sorts of support groups was nutritional deficiency. So when your heart doesn't get enough nutrients, it starts to suffer. 
And the next thing is chemotherapy and radiation. And this is specifically true for breast cancer treatments. Breast cancer treatments have a much higher rate of causing heart disease than other chemotherapies and radiation. Pregnancy, there's something called peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is pregnancy-induced heart failure. Well, have, I did have nutritional deficiency. I did not have cancer and I'm not pregnant. Emotional trauma. And this is broken heart syndrome is a real thing where your heart actually gets so sad, it just literally decides to stop working. Now, one of the things, this is a check for me because when I was in Argentina, I was mugged by three guys on the street and had everything taken. So I definitely had emotional trauma in there. Thyroid disease is another one. If you have untreated thyroid disease, it can affect the heart. And again, check for me, I actually have hypothyroidism. Um, untreated altitude sickness. So if you already have a heart defect or a heart condition and you go way up in the mountains and get altitude sickness and don't get it treated right away, it can affect the heart negatively. A virus, genetics, overtraining, and we'll come back to this later because this is something that you that the ladies asked for, uh, for more clarification on, but if you overtrain, you can actually cause heart disease. Um, too much carbohydrates and sugar. So in 1953, a group of cardiologists in the States actually called heart disease the third type of diabetes, which now they call the third type of diabetes Alzheimer's, but it was actually heart disease in the 1950s. Inflammation, this is what heart disease all boils down to, is inflammation in the body of any kind. Metabolic disorders, which comes back to too much carbohydrates and sugar. So you don't have to have um, high blood sugars in order to have a metabolic disorder. Metabolic disorder is pre-pre-diabetes. It's just your pancreas's in, inability to deal with carbohydrates and sugar. And then stress. And this is where, when I talked about before, about female heart disease in females almost doubling since the 1950s. And that's because, you know, in the 1950s and, the 19th and earlier, right, females were the homemaker. They were at home. They took care of the kids. But then nowadays, both parents have to work full time. It's a lot more stressful. They've got a lot more on their plate. They're in more um, demanding work jobs now too, like more people, more of us are as females. So it just creates a lot more stress. And the list kind of never went on. It was never ending. Yeah, just so many things that can cause it. So then I had to look at what could I do to heal myself? So I decided to optimize nutrition. So I got a nutritional panel, vitamin panels done and saw what I was deficient in and then ate and supplemented to correct those. Learning to exercise at the correct heart rate. As an athlete, I always overtrained and stressed my heart out <laughs> too much. And again, we'll come back to that exercise thing later. Um, and then healed my trauma. So I worked with a counselor to heal my trauma. Find purpose in life. That's huge because when you're diagnosed with a chronic illness, your whole life changes. You don't know what you are. You know, um, you don't know how you fit into your life anymore. So having to find that again is important. Um, research, always staying on top of research and not throwing any idea aside how silly it may sound. And learning to stick up for yourself. And in females, it's huge. Um, you know, it's very, very common that if a young person goes into an emergency room with chest pains and has tests done and the tests are negative, a male 
they'll say we'll hospitalize you, we'll admit you for observation, and the female will be told, here's some Xanax, you know, go home and relax. So it's, so you have to learn to stick up for yourself. I had to learn to stick up for myself <laughs> when things weren't right. I am not above throwing a two-year-old temper tantrum, and I'm serious. <laughs> I need to um, find medical professionals who will listen to you and hold on to them with dear life because they're keepers. Learning to listen to my body and honor its wants and needs. And then the last thing is to love yourself. Our heart actually has its own brain and it registers the sights and sounds around you and it registers your self-talk before your subconscious and your consciousness does. And so learning, so loving yourself and being able to talk positively to yourself is huge. And in fact, it's so huge that doctors have said that if you're in a critical situation where you've got a critical illness or a critical injury, that positive self-talk 50% determines if you will live or die. And that's big. So then I managed to switch everything around for myself, following my plan and putting it together and putting it to use and get my heart back to pretty much normal. So now I need to go into a maintenance phase where I need to maintain where I'm at. And the big one is, is getting enough sleep. Lack of sleep or too much sleep is not a good thing. Um, your heart isn't like a limb. You break your arm, you break your leg, you can cast it, tell it to be still. Your heart has to keep beating, so it needs that downtime. To repair itself. So that's why it's important to get enough sleep. I'm eating a low carb paleo diet. So making sure that I'm not having too much sugar and carbohydrates, um, making sure that everything that I have is as natural as possible. And um, because toxins do not help <laughs> with heart function. The other thing is staying hydrated. Being dehydrated is very, very hard on your heart. And then the next thing is making sure to consume enough electrolytes. Um, so your electrolytes are sodium, magnesium, and potassium. And did you know that only 25% of the Earth's population should be on the recommended two grams or less of sodium per day? that the average adult needs double that at three to four grams of sodium per day to maintain proper bodily functions. Salt um, helps with brain function. It keeps brain fog at bay. Your natural pacemaker, your sinal atrius node, um, it needs salt to function. So if it's not functioning, that's when, you, when it doesn't have enough salt, then you get arrhythmias and palpitations. All right, and even digestion. And salt also regulates sugar and glucose in the body. So it's very, very important. And then magnesium and potassium are just so important um, to bodily functions. Magnesium helps calcium and vitamin D be absorbed into the bones. And this is one that surprised me when I found this out, but 50, the but not 50, 40 to 60 percent of heart attacks are are from blockages in blood vessels, and it is estimated that 40 to 60 percent. So the other 40 to 60 percent of heart attacks are actually from magnesium deficiency because magnesium helps your muscles work. So when you're deficient, your muscles can actually spasm and cause a heart attack. Now. Because of our current farming practices, we are 94% deficient, sorry. 94% of us are deficient in magnesium. So it's an important one to kind of stay up on. And then potassium helps regulate um, your 
uh, your kidneys and blood volume, like the amount of blood in your in your vessels and everything. So it's very important too. So having lots of those, uh, coming back to the exercise at the correct heart rate, which we'll come back to, learning to meditate and really go into oneself and listen to yourself is important. Another thing is earthing. Earthing is when you just put your bare skin, so bare feet, on the earth, on the ground, and let it soak in. Now, we are bombarded every day by modern day devices, your computer, your phone, your fridge, your TV, all of it. And what and what this does is our body is comprised of both positive and negative electrons. And so when we get too much of electronics near us and around us all the time, then we start to go on balance. So we have too much electrons and too little protons. Okay, and this can advert this can cause chronic disease. So by earthing, the earth actually pulls out the excess electrons and brings it back to a balance. So spending time each day just barefoot on the grass. Listening to my body. Like what does it want today? Some days it wants an ice cream and all right. Can I give you an ice cream? Because you're going to throw a fit body if you don't get your ice cream. <laughs> and then learning to work with my medical professionals as a team. You know, when I finally found that medical professional who I can sit with for an hour and discuss, you know, different treatments, that was when I found the jackpot with somebody who I could actually talk and discuss with and honored and respected. I felt comfortable doing so. Alrighty, <laughs> I'm throwing so much information at you. How's everybody doing so far? Do we need to loosen up a little bit? <laughs> okay, so we're going to get into the next part, which is the exercise part. And we're going to talk about something called the U-curve, or some people refer to it as the J-curve. So we have our two types of people here on the U-curve, right? At one end, we have our lovely couch potato. And at the other end, we have our fitness buffs, okay, on the two ends. And then at the U, at the rounded part there, is where we have everybody in the middle. Who's a little bit lazy, a little bit exercisey, you know, and eats pretty healthy most of the time. So who do you think actually has the higher risk for a heart disease? The couch potato or the fitness buff? Yeah, they actually have the exact same risk for heart disease. And this is where we come back to the whole thing of yeah, it's pretty surprising. And it, it actually breaks my heart when, you know, on support groups and stuff, when I see people who are like, I'm so fit, I'm a firefighter, and I had a heart attack, and I don't know why. Nobody knows why. It's a mystery. And it breaks my heart because this is not known, and they don't know how to protect themselves. So one of the reasons why... Um, they, you would get heart disease if you're a fitness buff is because you're not, you're eating, paring down your eating so small that you're actually nutri nutrient deficient. You're losing too many electrolytes. So your magnesium specifically, when I said like 40 to 60% of heart attacks are estimated to be from magnesium deficiency. Okay. That's not replenishing magnesium enough. Um, working at too high of a heart rate for too much. For too long. So you can work at that super high heart rate, but it shouldn't be for more than an hour a day at that super high heart rate. So these are the things that 
I like to educate on and that I like to help people kind of learn about and teach them about themselves. So what I am going to do now, oh no, <laughs> you tried to spin class, wow. Yeah, spin classes really get your heart rate up there, don't they? <laughs> yeah, okay, and, oh, did I freeze? Yeah, so having rest and downtime is so important when you go from that. So I am going to stop sharing this for a second. And you guys can, who are here right now, can take yourselves off mute if you want. And I am going to show her with you my super duper calculator and show you the, um, the formulas that I use to help you calculate your exact heart rate that will strengthen the heart muscle. All right, so let's share again, which one? And I'm going to show you both the male and the female one so that you can see the difference between the two genders because this is something that, um, again, most people don't recognize is that females and males are different when it comes to exercise, nutrition, and medicine. And it was a, an Indian exercise physiologist named Martha Gulati who came up with this formula that females only need 88% of a male to achieve the same results. So this is my calculator and this is me that I'm doing if I was a man. So this is if I was a man. So my resting average heart rate is 61. I'm 38 and my maximum would be 187. Okay. Now this is where we get into really some fancy technical stuff um, for exercise. So there are four stages of exercise for the heart. The first one is what's called 30 to 40% of your heart rate reserve. And heart rate reserve is the difference between your resting and your maximum. So you, this heart rate area is good um, for three to four weeks after any medicine change, uh, one to four weeks after illness or mental or emotional trauma, letting your heart just rest, and four to eight weeks after surgery. Level two is 40 to 60% of your HRR, and it's once you've done level one, for a while, um, you can stay at level one heart rate, which is generally like a nice gentle walk. Um, and you can do it without any major shortness of breath. And then you can stay here if you have heart disease and EF is ejection fraction and that's the amount of blood that gets pushed out of the heart each beat. So if your score is above 50, um, you stay here until your score is above 40 in this range. And then this is your optimum, and this is the magic number, is 65%. And this is the number where your heart's going to get the most benefit for exercise. So this is important. So if I was a man, it would be 143 would be my optimal heart rate to exercise at. All right. Um, and so this is where when you exercise that you'd want to stay. And then level th and then level four, the th third level, there is um, 70 to 90%. And this is where you're going to be getting um, the most cardiovascular benefit. So the most endurance benefit. So that's that calculated there. So if we just remember those numbers, so 187 and 143. And we're just gonna share my screen again. I need to get this on like the same one <laughs> so I can have them side by side. <laughs> okay, so then this is my numbers if I was a female. So we said the maximum heart rate was 187 if I was a male and if I'm a female, it's 173. We said my optimum was 143 and as a female, my optimum is 134. And so it's like, it's not huge difference, but it's different enough that it matters when you're trying to exercise. Um, 
And if anybody has, um, if anybody knows what kind of their resting average is and would like to have their numbers put through the calculator, I can do that for you. I think I'm 60. This is Adara. Okay, Adara, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we I'm can track. Yeah, and I'll be 40. Soon. Be 40. 30, I'm 39. I'm 39. You're 39. <laughs> okay, so there we go. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So your maximum heart rate would be 172 and your optimum is 133. Okay. And where do I usually find that? Uh, you have here level one is like walking, gardening. Do you have something for optimum? I do. Yeah. Optimal yeah, is pretty so much anything. Yeah. It's a big, huge document. <laughs> um, anything that will get your heart rate up that's to that cool. level to sustain. Um, hit is your best friend. So mm -hmm. that's high interval intensity training for those of you listening who don't know what hit is. And that's when you go between um, like strength exercise, resistance training and endurance training. Yeah, and then, and level three is the same. So, awesome. Yeah. So it's just anything that you to do that. Yeah. Thank what you. You're very welcome. Any other questions or anybody else would like to go? Yeah. Laura, this is Laura. I totally want to ask you about how long should I wait in between? Like, actually, do you want to plug in my resting heart rate and my age? <laughs> I think I'm 61 for yeah. my resting heart rate, and I'm 49. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there we go. So then your maximum okay. is 163. And okay. your optimum is 127. Right. So yeah, it's so if I want to do these incremental changes, the 92 to 97 to 102, is that the week that I take like one week, two week, three week? And this is where it's going to be. That's a really good question, and it really depends on you and where you're coming from, right? Like if you're just if it's just like you had a coal and the 48 hour flu, you would probably work through these, you know, pretty quickly, right? You would probably right. like, maybe within a week, you'd be, you know, up to level, up to level three. Right. But if it was something more serious, it's really, it really depends on you and you just have to listen to your body and when you feel ready. So my thing is, is that if you can sustain exercise at that heart rate for an hour and you want to do more mm. then you're ready for the next level but if you do that exercise for an hour and you want to like collapse then you've done too much and or you're not ready for the next level can Thank you just you. tell us jackie what you use to monitor your heart and what we could maybe use uh yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely um, so I actually use a chest strap. One second here. So it just goes around you and it has electrodes on the back and it syncs through to my phone on an app. And that's what I use because that is um, more accurate than the wrist ones like a Fitbit or an Apple watch. It'll be more accurate, especially if once your heart rate gets above 150. And or if you have a if you have irregular heartbeats of any kind, the wrist ones won't catch them once you get up at about 120. So I prefer a chest strap um, plus I think that if I wore a wrist one all the time, you know, I'd, I'd be wearing it all the time. And then you have, um, and then you have electric magnetic frequencies going right into your veins all the time, which isn't good for your heart either. Where this is just like, it's exercise, you're not gonna wear it all the time. You need to get off. Yeah. Whew. Are there any other questions? And do you have an idea, Jackie, of what the, the fastest way I could start a program like this? 
The fastest way you can start a program like this? Very good question. Um, the fastest way would be to get yourself evaluated by like myself or another cardiac rehab specialist um, or to get a stress test done. That'll tell you where you're at. And to get a device such as um, a chest strap or a Fitbit or your Apple Watch that will monitor your heart rate. And just once you know your numbers, you can just do exercise to your target heart rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dara. Alrighty. Are there any other questions on the on the heart rate calculator? <laughs> Well, I just have a comment. I, I'm so like amazed at from all of this, you did so much research and so much investigating to really become a true advocate for your heart health. And it's something that I think we're just blindsided by. Like I never thought about my nutrition. Um, mm -hmm. Only recently did I add salt because I have low blood pressure and I, I wanna increase my blood pressure and it made me feel better when I started mm -hmm. taking salt. But I never even also thought about moving incrementally with my heart rate mm -hmm. and building it up. Like it, it's like yeah. endurance for the heart. Exactly. Yeah. All right. And we'll just change this again. Did you want to take a screenshot or anything, Laura? So you have it or I think. Yep. I'm going to take a screenshot. Okay, before I now. change it. Got, got it. Thank you. You're very welcome. Just let me know when you're done. Yeah. I, it, yeah. It only took me a second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll let. Okay, Drinks. Got it. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I heard yours go off there. I know yours went. <laughs> And I think we lost Beth there, did we? Okay. All right. So yeah. So we'll stop that then. Everybody's got theirs. And we will share. Where is my? Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Where are we? Oh, we've got to go back up here. All right. Oh, I love it when I do that. Okay, there we go. That's what I was expecting. <laughs> I like this, but I think I need to change it for this next time. Okay. Okay. So, and the last bit um, that I want to share with everybody today is something called heart math. So I am a heart math practitioner and heart math is where you um, use your breathing and visualization to calm the body down and calm the heart down. So I'd like to share with you guys some heart math today. So what we're going to do is we're going to put our hands just nicely wherever they are, sitting up nice and relaxed, however you are right now. Okay, and just going to breathe and lengthening through the top of our head. And exhale, shoulders back and down. Just letting everything go. Breathing in through the top of your head. And exhale back and down with the shoulders. And when you're breathing, making sure that you're making your stomach move and not your chest. Really feeling it up. Okay, and on your next inhale, I want you to think about pulling in all this lovely oxygen into your heart. And then as you exhale, all that oxygen rich blood going to every single cell in your body and filling it up. And 
Inhale, filling your heart up with oxygen. And exhale, letting all the lovely red blood cells go to every single cell in your body. And just keep breathing at your own pace. Inhale, filling your heart up with oxygen. And exhale, sending all that oxygen rich blood to every single cell in your body. And slowly wiggling your fingers and wiggling your toes. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back to the beginning. Come back to the screen. <laughs> okay, so how did everybody feel after that? Nice and relaxed, yeah. Ready for PJs and lovely, excellent, yes, ready for PJs too. <laughs> So this is a way, a technique that you can use to turn off your flight and fight and turn on your relaxation. And it is the first step of learning to do heart math. So this is one of the things that I do. Alrighty. And now, oh, so not wanting to, there we go. So before we get into the games, I'm just gonna tell you what I offer. <laughs> Me too, Laura. I love heart math too. <laughs> so I offer a Kickstart Your Heart Health six-month program where we go into a full-on uh, coaching program for nutrition, exercise, heart math, life coaching, emergency planning, um, and do root cause detection really delve in to figure out what the root cause of your issues are. Um, I do single coaching sessions. I have my yoga classes, which are starting up next week. Yoga by Heart was the name that's been chosen. And then I also run a Healthy Heart book club on Wednesday nights, which is completely free. And you don't have to read the book to turn up to the meetings on Wednesday night. You can just come and hang out with us, learn something, and ask any questions you want in a loving and supporting environment. Alrighty, and oh, it's not letting me do that. So there is my information for everybody. If you would like to get in contact with me and you can definitely do that and make sure to follow me on social media. Um, I'm just coming to the end of Everyday Lives for Heart Month. So at 8 a.m. Pacific time, I go live every day with some heart facts. Um, and then starting in March, I will be jumping over to Influencer Platform and starting a group on there um, just to try to keep my information, my propriety. And I do get posts taken down. <laughs> on Facebook every once in a while. So starting with that. So that's all good. Alrighty. And the reason why I have a picture of myself hugging a tree is for the importance of human connection. So there's a very famous psychologist, child psychologist, who says in order for a 
child to to maintain they need four hugs a day in order for a child to grow they need eight hugs a day in order for a child to excel they need 12 hugs a day so make sure you give lots of hugs <laughs> and three hugs count